mic's a little loud. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Sean Dagg. I'm in the IBM Linux Technology Center. Um, I'm a core contributor on uh, Nova, the QA team, Tempest, DevStack, some of the upgrade testing on Grenade. Um, I review a lot of patches. Um, and so today, um, I figured I would give a, an introduction um, about what it really takes to get from having an idea about something that you want in OpenStack and getting it all the way through to uh, commit. Um, the, the sort of the origination of this talk was the fact that um, I find that I ex end up explaining this a lot to first time developers um, trying to get stuff into OpenStack. There's sort of this weird maze of things they don't realize when they first try to propose a commit of like, why, why did that get rejected for this reason, that reason, whatever. Um, so try to lay it out as much as possible and walk people through um, so that um, hopefully your first or some of your early development contributions um, can be successful. Um, and you can understand like when things are bad and when things are good as part of the process. Um, that QR code has a link to these slides or HTML. They're up on my personal website. You can, you know, there's a lot of links embedded in here. I'll stick this out on Twitter afterwards so that people can, can catch it later and, and dive into the links. Um, so I realized that, um, that we don't have um, just a US audience. So um, this whole soup to nuts thing, this is, I use a lot of American idioms. I apologize for people that aren't native English speakers. Um, it's, it's, it just means all the way from the beginning to all the way to the end. Um, so we start off with um, where, where do you start in this process? And we start with having an idea, right? I've got this great idea for a feature. I want to land an OpenStack or behavior that I think really should change. Um, and so that's great. So you've got this idea. Um, and the first thing you want to do when you have a new idea is actually go and talk to other people about it. Um, socialize it either on our mailing list, OpenStack Dev, um, or on the OpenStack Dev IRC channel, um, because as it turns out, um, OpenStack you know is a rapidly evolving project. A lot of people have a lot of the same great ideas all at the same time, um, and so it would be good to figure out if someone else is already working on what you think should go in next, um, and if if possible, um, then go and work with them on it. Um, from a review perspective, um, the last thing I want to see is three completely different incompatible approaches to the same thing that we want to add, because that just makes everything terrible to figure out. Like, you know, we, we when we're reviewing code, we typically don't want to play politics in the middle of that. It's like, if all you guys want this thing in, go back, work together, come up with some common thing and, and propose it. Um, that's the right thing to do. Um, and it's much better to join an existing effort than to, uh, to then cut off on your own. Um, the next thing that you really need to get to do, it's great to have an idea, it's great to bring it to the mailing list, it's great to talk about it. Um, it is much, much better if there is code. Um, you know, English only works so well in specifications of what this feature is, what this terminology is, whatever. Um, you know, OpenStack has a language, it's called Python, it's really good at describing solutions to problems because you can execute them. Um, so, so start with a prototype. Um, it doesn't have to be complete, it doesn't have to be, you know, everything, um, but it's something where people can actually now address this as a real, um, you know, as a, as a thing they can get their hands in and see not just what you're talking about, but the approaches to it. Um, things are just clearer in code. Um, it also, we get a lot of people that will show up and like suggest these great grandiose ideas. Um, if you've been to a design summit a few times, you will notice that some topic sessions have shown up at like every design summit and they don't seem to actually make traction. Um, so there is a, there's a cautiousness about people with just ideas and not willing to do work. Um, and so you show up with some code and that is huge. That shows you're serious, you're actually gonna do some work. That's great, we love that um, and um, we want it. So you, you write up the code and then you get it ready to contribute. Um, 
we're going to go into this in detail. This is most of what this talk is about is explaining what this diagram really means. But this is basically the contribution process to OpenStack. I'm using um, Nova as a, as a specific example um, as just one project, but this is true for anything that's core and anything that's incubated and anything that's in StackForge. They all work the same way. Um, where you're starting with an upstream master that's somewhere on GitHub and you clone it down and then you make a, you know, uh, fix within a branch in Git, um, and then um, you make sure that you run all the local unit tests, and then uh, and you commit this thing, and then you push it up for review. Um, we have a specific uh, extension to Git called Git Review that makes it much much simpler to interact with these Garrett review servers, which I'll show you some details of in the moment. Um, otherwise, it, you get some really gnarly URLs that you have to hard code all over the place. Um, so, you need to know Git. We're not going into that. We'll, we'll assume that as an exercise for the reader. But once you get to this point, you know, we don't use Git push. We don't use merge requests. We use this Garrett review system. And you have to install this Git review thing and you run it and um, it submits upstream. And so, you know, to prep your environment for that, it's actually, you know, once you clone some arbitrary upstream OpenStack repository, um, you just run this little command, sudo pip uh, install git review, and it installs git review, and then you have this git review command that you can run. Um, and in every project, we've already got config files which say, when you review this project at this branch, you push to this location, so you don't have to do all that nasty stuff yourself. Um, the first time you do this, something will probably go wrong. Um, many things will go wrong, but this will go wrong to a lot of people. Um, if you just run git review, you made your patch and you push it up there, um, you will get an error which looks very much like this, which is we can't look at your change because you have not signed the contributor license agreement. Um, and we actually reject inbound changes for people that aren't on the CLA um, with a URL to go deal with this in, uh, in Garrett. Um, which is a URI host. So the, the contributor's license agreement is something that OpenStack has as protection for um, any code that you bring to the, the project. You have signed an agreement legally that says you're allowed to bring this here and your employer says it's okay for you to bring this here. So we don't end up in a situation where there's code in OpenStack which was illicitly brought from some other third party environment that is not appropriate for the project. Um, um, so then the, uh, once you've gotten through that, you just have to go and sign the agreement. There's a process on that. There's a bunch of explanation in the wiki about that. Um, now we're into actual reviews. Um, is that as washed out head on as it is from the side? Okay, great. <laughs> Be a little harder to read some of the smaller text. Okay, um, what's important about these vague, unclear blocks of text here? So, um, Garrett is a code review system. It lives at uh, review.openstack.org. Um, when you push up a, a git commit, you've got, uh, it will demonstrate that it's got, you know, the commit message in here. Um, you can, specify things like uh, blueprints or bugs that it implements. Uh, and then what's important that you'll see here is there's a whole voting process. Um, and we'll start with humans and then we'll move to non-human voting. Um, so every change that goes up has a formal review process by humans. And um, anyone, anyone on the internet, anyone in this room can go start reading OpenStack code and can start um, adding reviews to it. Um, just by logging into Garrett um, with an open ID, you can start reviewing code and helping us make things better and add your comments to it. Everyone gets a, minus, a plus one or a minus one vote. Um, these are fundamentally advisory, but they are very useful. Um, as a core contributor that has a lot of code I should be reviewing, one of the first things I go and look for is did someone else plus one or minus one this code? Because if someone else minus one it, 
That's at the bottom of the queue. I might get to it. Someone else plus one'd it. OK, somebody thinks this is good enough to at least go in and dive a little deeper. Um, that's a, a huge indicator, and that means that you know, that's where I'm going to spend my time. Um, core contributors within each of the projects, um, and it's a separate sort of bit for every project, is uh, gets a plus two and a minus two vote. Um, and so the formal policy for all projects in OpenStack is two plus twos are required to make any code go further um, to actually approve. Um, there's a separate actual like approve bit that gets set, um, but usually the second person, the plus two code, does that. Um, if a minus one vote, if you, um, you can upload a new copy of your code, a new new iteration, and, the and all the minus one and plus one votes and the plus two votes all reset, and so it's like this is a new patch, whatever. Um, there's also the minus two vote is really, you know, we call it, you know, like the ban hammer. Um, this is someone throws this down if the approach is fundamentally flawed or dangerous for whatever reason they feel as a core contributor, and that sticks. So that will block this code from ever going in until that person goes and pulls that hold on it. It is used very rarely um, because minus one advisories are, are pretty useful. Um, the comments can be general or line specific. Those have links showing instances of both in them um, where you can actually, we can annotate per line of code. And typically a detailed review will actually go through and say, okay, you know, minus one and like this, you did a wrong thing here, this thing should be better, this, um, like why did you add this new variable, this, you know, and it, people will give very detailed feedback. Um, minus one to a patch is a normal first reaction. People often freak out, they like submit their first bit of code and they get a minus one like three hours later and they're like, oh my God, what did I do wrong, what did I do wrong? Nothing, this is exactly normal, this is normal behavior. Um, you know. The reason we do code reviews is to make the code better on every iteration. So minus one is normal. Um, we actually ran some statistics, <coughs> and like basically every commit that actually lands in Git takes on average three iterations before it lands. And that's across the entire spectrum, right? When people are first new at this, it's probably a couple more. You know, I've been on the cells uh, bare metal um, I was one of the key reviewers to help the bare metal stuff into the pipeline. And I mean, that was six months that they were working that patch series and like 30 iterations before we got it to where it needed to be. Um, and that's fine, right? It's, the point is what lands in OpenStack eventually, we have to, it has to be ready for the tree. It has to be code that the core contributors believe in. You know, it doesn't go and modify things in ways that we don't feel we can support in the future. Um, you know, in the process of contributing, this is becoming owned by whatever the core community team is, and like they have to be able to feel like they can support it going forward. Um, if you've gotten minus one, uh, make sure to iterate on your your code quickly because um, it will be ignored. Um, typically, like, again, like I said, I've got a limited time. I'm trying to review as much code as possible, and those things fall to the bottom of my list. Um, this is a link to a URL of the code that I'm supposed to view, review on a regular basis, and you will understand why um, I look for easy things to ignore, because um, there's a lot on it. Um, responsiveness is super critical. Um, you really want to iterate quickly when someone provides you feedback, um, not sort of sit on it and figure out if someone else is going to you know, accept it later because they won't. Um, and responsiveness is, is highly appreciated, right? As a reviewer, you know, I comment on something and I'll probably be in the code review system for, you know, the next hour or two working on stuff. And if I see comments coming back immediately, like I'm actually in a mode to handle that. Like that's huge. I remember that. I remember who you were. It means when I see code from you come through again, I'm going to like preferentially go look at that code because I know that if I provide you feedback, you are going to respond quickly and like it's an actively really good use of my time, right? So responsiveness is, is awesome. Be as responsive as possible. Um, don't get argumentative, which is sort of the inverse of that. Um, you, in almost all cases, cannot argue your way out of a negative review. Um, and that's a new idea for people, some people. 
um, and it, you know, realized that like the feedback was there for a reason, and and be nice about it. We all try to be nice. Um, and when you're updating patches, it's important to use the git commit amend. Um, we put this item potent version string in all the git commit messages, so when you upload version two or version three or whatever of your code, then it will properly be identified as Garrett as the same code and list as an update. And so all the history of the past code reviews will be in there, which is really useful um, to understand how this thing evolved over time. Yes? Um, it doesn't, right? But responsiveness is the important thing. If it's, if it's a day, that's good. Um, if it's a week, that's bad, right? Um, and the reality is the core teams are, um, I mean, on something like Nova, we've got people in a lot of scattered time zones. So it may not be that I pick up something, but other people will notice that, like, that a patch went in and somebody said, no, you got to go fix this thing, and then you did you know, when it was sort of a natural cycle for you within 12 hours or whatever, and then like, it gets noticed, right? And that's the thing, is that in reality, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at these code and this code reviews, and, and um, part of you as a new contributor and contributing to OpenStack, building kind of a personal reputation, you know, once you stare at a lot of code, you remember, oh, you know, like, Boris always like throws out some awesome stuff. He's this database guy that we've got in the project, and it's like, you know, Great, like whenever Boris throws out something, I go try to look at it immediately because like he's always hyper responsive to, to what's going on and I wanna you know, help him through the process. Because that's the thing, realistically as a core contributor, we are sort of you know, shepherding things. That's part of our goal. It's keeping, keeping stuff out that really can't go in, but then stuff that people are showing up and being very willing to work on things, it's part of like, okay, so how do we, how do we make this work within OpenStack in a way that like doesn't break anyone else, doesn't break any of our core tenants of scale out and, and share nothing, but you know, we do want more con contributors. And the growth of the, of the contributors you've seen release to release is sort of a reflection of that general attitude. Um, the um, minus twos are, are, are very much reserved for, for code that can't go in for various reasons. It might be, you know, there might be horrible, like it doesn't, it goes in a direction the project just doesn't want to go in, it goes in, um, it does something that's just not possible, it would be really bad, it breaks backwards compatibility, it happen, goes in at the wrong time, right, we have freeze areas, and you know, once we pass freeze, you know, myself, like on Nova this past cycle, we passed freeze and people kept pushing features, and it was just like, nope, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, like all that stuff's held, it will reopen in Havana, but like, don't show up with features after freeze. We're done, um, and and realize you know what's part of the natural cycle. Um, so if you get a minus two, make sure like you figure out with the person you get enough feedback to understand like why it can't go in. Was it a timing reason? Was it a structural reason? Was it something that's just not appropriate for the project at all? Um, because that needs real serious reconsideration about the approach. Um, tips for being successful. Start small, right? If you are a new contributor um, and um, coming here and you have like a super important feature that your particular company or area is interested in, don't start with your first introduction to the community, 4,000 line change um, throwing in. It's just not a good idea. And a lot of people don't realize this, right? It's like, here we go, here's my giant new vendor driver and I've never seen anyone before and I haven't followed the style guidelines and like stop. Um, do some small things first, go fix a couple of bugs first, get familiar with the process, get familiar with the people involved, it's just a lot easier. Um, smaller is always better than big, you know, if you do changes they should be, you know, minimum possible that they can be in size, they're just easier to review, like I can, when I start my day, I get a cup of coffee, I sit down on my laptop, I bring up the code review system and I start looking. And so the first thing I do is I go and look for 12 line changes that I can just say like, yep, that was obviously a bug and we and that's a plus two, right? And I try to bang as many of those out as quickly as possible. I go look at stuff that other people have plus two because I'm on East Coast time and the, uh, the entire continuous integration system is basically there's nothing in it when I wake up. So I've got the entire 
um, merge CI system more or less to myself. So I start with everything that somebody else has plus twoed on projects that I can and figure out like what's mergeable. Because if I merge it early before the Pacific Coast guys wake up, like we got all the code in and like they didn't have to worry about it and we have more um, runtime for testing later in the day. So, so easy things that like it's super easy for someone to say put that in um, is great. Um, use good commit messages. You know, it seems like a minimal thing. You know, it seems like a thing that the people don't tend to want to worry about sometimes. But like really good commit messages are huge because people just like re. You know, when I look at a piece of code, I need to understand why. Like, what is the rationale for this changing? And if and if it's just a link to a bug somewhere else that I then got to go read and then figure out like, wait, was this really the fix for this bug or what was the issue, whatever, like, all right, maybe I'll deal with that one later. But if it's like in the commit is like very distinct, you know, one line, here's what this is about, a paragraph or two explaining exactly what's going on and why this is the approach to fix it, then I can look at that, I can look at the review, uh, the code, and I just be like, oh yeah, clear, go, right? Um, and whenever possible, if there are relative bugs or blueprints, you know, reference that. We can also do patch series within Garrett, um, if you're familiar that, with that in Git. If you have a whole bunch of changes that you need to make, don't make them as one big block, make them as a series, you know, dependent patch series, and you, you know, basically a whole bunch of commits in a Git branch, and you do Git review, and it pushes them all up in sequence, and they're all tied to each other, and they'll do all the right things. Um, and again, it's easier to review. Um, so people review code. Machines review code too. Um, so when you push, uh, we start off with, uh, immediately we run a whole bunch of tests um, by Jenkins. Um, so Jenkins is very chatty on all the reviews. And if you've ever wondered who this Jenkins guy is, um, it is our continuous integration system that runs all our tests. And um, it will, the moment there's code out there, it will go and, and run a series of tests. Um, when Jenkins minus ones things, um, it will provide a report. You know, it won't like go into a detailed list of what was in your code, but it will provide a report of, well, I ran the following, you know, we had test failures and here's links to all the logs of the results of these tests. Um, and these are all hot links, you can go into them and you can figure out like why they failed. Um, make sure you do that. I have seen many times when people just, you know, like don't understand and they, we have this ability to rerun tests and they just keep running tests that are failed. And it's like, no, no your test failed for a reason. You have to go read the logs and figure out why. Um, the tests that we run are, um, we have a whole bunch of different checks. So um, we have a style checker. We enforce style in the code. We inf um, that's the PEP8 Python style. We also have additional style rules that we enforce programmatically. Um, it's easier to review for them. We, we try to make, anytime we've said like this is suggested style, we enforce it in a machine so that, you know, people don't have to spend brain power on that. Um, we build docs, we run unit tests on two different versions of Python. Um, we set up a full node environment, run dev stack on it, um, and Tempest, and we'll dive into the detail. And starting very soon, we're gonna be doing um, upgrade testing from Grizzly to master on every commit to make sure that you didn't land, you, the proposed change didn't break um, an offline upgrade of all the services so that we ensure compatibility of um, upgrade to the next release. Um, the style checker, uh, everything that's in the style checker is in this Git repo. Um, it's based on flak, uh, Flake 8. It actually finds some interesting Python issues like reuse of variables in funny ways or or code that is going to break when it runs, um, as well as the PEP8 rules, um, style checking. Um, and we run this early before everything else so that we don't bother to run all the rest of the tests if it doesn't fail um, the style guidelines because it just can't go in otherwise. Um, you know, this seems like a minor thing, it seems like we're nitpicking, but when you have 550 active developers over a six month cycle, and you know, half a million lines of code, consistency is the only road to sanity. So we have to enforce this. Um, we run unit tests on um, every project itself defines what its unit tests are. 
Um, in the Nova instance, there are over 5,000 unit tests in tree. Um, they get run on Python 2.6 and 2.7 on Ubuntu. Um, we're working to get them running on 2.6 on RHEL 6. Um, and you know, believe it or not, there's actually enough differences between 2.6 and 2.7 that we run them both because there's a failure, you know, we'll get fails in one and not in the other. Um, these unit tests are basically, when they do database stuff, it's typically an in-memory database, so it's, it's very synthetic, although we do a little bit of upgrade testing on real databases within here when it comes to our migrations. Um, we do, on every commit, on every proposed commit, you push a piece of code, you push a one-line change, we go and spin up three virtual machines. Um, on each of the virtual machines, we spin up DevStack, which is an installation tool for, um, for developers to get an e easy version of OpenStack running right off the master of Git. Um, and we bring up a one-node OpenStack within that guest with a specific configuration. We've done the, we do this sort of three different ways to do a matrix of different configurations. And then we have a battery of 700 integration tests that runs um, that uh, ensures that, you know, when you call through Nova to Cinder, the right things all happen. Um, over the course of running Tempest, which is that test suite, we spin up around 75 virtual machines um, and do various horrible things to them. Um, we do the same with volumes and images and glance and, and, and some to the network. Uh, Quantum's a little less tested in here. Um, and then we also run against the, the Nova and glance command lines and do some basic operations from the command line approach. Um, and pretty soon, like we have this mostly working, it'll be gating within a two weeks probably, where um, we're also going to make sure that you can upgrade from Grizzly to whatever your code version was compatibly. Um, and that gets looked at every proposed code commit. Not on the merge, it's on every proposed. So the numbers sometimes get staggering about like how many OpenStack instances we create a day. Um, it's in the thousands um, as just part of a normal, normal run cycle. Um, so. You know, hopefully this graph looks a little bit more clear now of, of what all these extra blocks were here about, you know, the review process that we've got, how Jenkins automates it. And once you get through all of this, right, success. Um, you have successfully turned your idea into an OpenStack commit. You've landed it. Um, you know, hopefully it didn't take you an inordinate amount of time, um, but it's a, you know, it's a victory and, and you get to do a victory lap on it. Um, there's a couple more useful links that are in my slides, um, which again, I'll stick this out on Twitter in about 10 minutes once all things are said and done here. Um, talking about what the Garrett workflow is, you know, what it means to be a core developer and like, and, and part of the whole plus two voting model. Um, and we've got some decent how to contribute pages as well on the wiki. Um, and you know, you can follow me on Twitter too. I'm pretty easy to find. So with that, um, we got about 10 minutes left in the session. I want to end a little early for questions um, and because it's the end of the day and people are probably as fried as I am right now. But um, so, so we'll throw it out there if anyone wants to ask a question about things. Yes? Yeah, so, so in Garrett itself, um, there's actually a way to add reviewers. You can add them by name or email address. Um, so if there are specific reviewers that um, you think should be checking out your code, put it in there. The reality is um, it works in some people's cases, it doesn't in others because, you know, in, just in my case, um, my review queue is so long and I get so much email from the system, I'm just mostly going through a normal filter mechanism. Um, the other thing that can happen is that most um, most teams um, have like a weekly meeting in IRC, and so if you've um, got 
some change that you really, you know, want to get some eyes on and it, it's not, people aren't um, looking at it, that's usually a pretty good time to raise that. There's usually a, a section at the end that's sort of left for like, what are reviews that people are looking for that, that people like haven't seen attention on so far. Um, you know, I know we do that some in the Nova and the QA meetings. Um, I assume some of the other projects do the same thing. Um, but, but again, right, getting active on IRC just in general on the dev channel and kind of asking questions there and asking if someone would take a look at this um, is probably a good thing to do. Um, don't be hyper insistent about it. Um, I, you know, like I'll pick on some of my friends on the Red Dwarf project. They were trying to get some stuff in the dev stack and like literally like every six hours they're like, look at this review, look at this review, look, stop. <laughs> Like, I, you know, I'll, I'm going to eventually get to it, but you're not making your case right now, right? Like, it's just, it'll take a little time. Um, one, of the, one of the key bout, like, uh, trade-offs that we try to manage within the core projects is making sure that we have a core review team that's big enough that the review backlog is not getting too crazy, right? That we have enough people so we keep moving the review backlog. Um, and honestly, my, one of my strategies, again, for processing the queue, you know, not the, like, let me move as much code through as possible, but my other strategy that I go and do is I actually, for, for exactly the, the folks that, like, no one's looked at their stuff yet, I, I go visually scan my review for anything at Jenkins is plus one that's, like, a day old that no one else has seen a review on because, like, that's not cool, right? We need to be responsive, more responsive than that and try to provide feedback. Um, and I know a lot of other reviewers try to do the same sort of tactics, but like stuff gets missed, right? Like, you know, my, I can probably actually show you what my, well, well maybe I can, it'll actually come through. Uh, my review queue is kind of stupid big and, um, yeah. I don't know if I can find out where my cursor is. There it is. Yay, non-mirrored screens. Um, what? Oh, it only took the, really? That can't be right. <laughs> there's no way that fits on one screen. It is, pay yes, there's a next button, never mind. Yeah, yeah, no, actually on the other, oh, because I'm not signed in, that's why. Um, on my preference, uh, on my user account, I have uh, like 100 items per page, and like typically it's a couple of pages of that, so it's just like, you know, okay, I'm gonna go after what I can go after. Um, and, you know, and the rest of it, like, if anyone's here trying to push a, a review this week, um, you won't get reviewed. Um, we're all here and we're all a little too fried to look at code right now. Other, yes, sure. Yep, that's a good piece of feedback. There's a question over here. Okay. Is there something you're looking for? Um, not really. The only thing is, uh, so we have a, if you write in your commit message, like um, bug and then a number, um, the, the system automatically turns that into a hyperlink that goes back to Launchpad for that bug ID. So like, um, and if you do that, there is, there's actually another interface into all of this um, called Review Day, which hangs off of the main OpenStack project, which um, actually does another thing where it, it sort of priority weights the reviews based on the severity of the bugs that they're fixing. So like fixing important bugs, your stuff goes all the way to the top. Um, so like linking to, if you're actually fixing a bug, linking to the bug is, it'll actually generate a lot more visibility for it. Other than that, the process is all just the same, right? Um, and if you're working on a blueprint, right, you know, we use this process by which 
new features, any substantial new feature really needs to have a blueprint in Launchpad so that we kind of track it towards release and we use it as the release notes and features and everything. Um, and the same thing, you like there's a, you put blueprint and then the name of the blueprint, um, it will automatically link it and it will actually bump your stuff up on the review cycle as well. Yes, there's a. So, yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. So, um, so we recommend to everyone that when you're working on a feature or bug, you create a, a dedicated branch for that specific thing. Um, so you'll make your commit. So your your branch will be one commit off of master, right? And then you you push it. And um, this Git review script that we do, uh, what it one of the things that it does is it it generates and declares another ID field and it injects it into the commit message. And so that goes out to Garrett and Garrett will track based on that ID in the future. So when someone says like, no, 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 you know, like, you know, gives you a minus one and says go fix this and this and that and the other, then you just, all you have to do is go into that branch, fix whatever it was and do a, a git commit amend and that will, instead of generating another commit on top of that, it'll actually modify the previous one and then you just run git review again. And it will then update, and that will show up as patch two on that same thing. And you can do this as many times as you want. Um, if you're doing patch series, um, you can, um, they'll all end up with IDs and dependent on each other and, and all the like fun rebase dash i stuff. Like it does everything you expect it to do. You just gotta make sure you keep that, that ID that got injected the same. Um, and people get really mad if you submit like duplicate stuff for the same thing and you didn't keep that ID um, because they see it over here and then you lose the, the history of review and that's actually kind of important because people have left a lot of comments about like no do this, no do that. And also, you know, realize that like the core teams on these projects are, we are not always of one mind. Um, so sometimes it's really useful when someone like, no, no, minus one, I don't like that. And you're like, but, 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 but Russell said to do exactly that in this previous part of the review, and they're like, um, uh, okay, right, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, right? Um, and so it's helpful for us too to realize like when we're being inconsistent and to try to like, you know, be nicer to people about that. Or, I mean, honestly, the right thing to do, you know, if, you know, we're doing it right is like, oh, you push review three, there were three other core reviewers that have reviewed this in the past, go look at what it was before, how they commented on it, and ensure that, that you're following what they asked of it, right? And because we do try to work collaboratively like that, where it's like, well, this was the recommendation, and like, okay, did they follow the recommendation? If they did, I'm cool with it. I don't see any new issues. And like, you know, the person that originally starts reviewing the patch may not be the person that eventually gets it all the way to the end. Um, we we definitely hand off work like that. Just you know, it's part of the nature. There was a question here. That's true. The, yeah, yeah. So the, the docs have a couple of checks that are specific to them. Um, they're kind of unit tests per se, right? It's got to build, because all the docs are based like, uh, you know, XML or SGML stuff. And so it's got to actually compile out and be able to be published to the site. Um, and so the checks are just a little different. It's conceptually the same model. And so if you're working in the OpenStack manuals tree or like the API site tree or any of those other documentation projects, conceptually it's the same approach. Like obviously we don't run the code tests, right? But you know, otherwise it's it's the same. Any other questions? One in the back. Um, so right now all of the core projects are Python, um, all of them. Um, I don't know that it's if you were to create a new core project. Um, well, so and, and I'll put an exception, there are some of the tools which also have shellcode in them that aren't core projects, but they're part of our testing infrastructure. Um, it, if you were to start a new core project that you would want to incubate through OpenStack, I don't know that's a hard and fast rule that it's Python, but, but this, this is where the community has, has emerged on, so 
it might be a hard sell. Um, try to, if you're committed, if you're adding features to existing stuff, use whatever they're doing, right? Um, otherwise, it's just, it's just not gonna fly. So, there's another question here, yep. Yeah, so um, uh, I think official policy is two pass stables. Yeah, um, so we have stable branches. If you check out the stable, like stable Grizzly branch of Nova, um, that's, there's actually a separate stable maintenance team that has plus two on that, that's, that's handling the stable on that. Um, and if, I think official policy is two back. So, so stable Grizzly and stable Folsom are currently being maintained. Stable Essex is sort of not you know, it means that if people really want to still do some stuff there, they might, but like, but but typically after three, like the stable main team that's on that just doesn't so care anyway. Kind of like no, no, so yeah, um, there is, yeah, so this right here, this is a stable grizzly change. Um, that's, you know, that's in my review tool as well. The reality is the volume in stable is much less by nature like it should be, right? Stable, stable, we only bring back critical bug fixes, security issues, and whatnot. <coughs> Anything else? There was one there, and we'll take one here, and then we'll call it beer time. Yeah, so all the unit tests, um, there's typically either a, literally a run test.sh or like a, a, in the readme, like how to run the unit tests directly locally. Um, on, so that will give you all the unit tests run. So in Nova, right, you'd run 5,000 tests. They take, you know, six minutes on a laptop. Um, the Tempest dev stack, what we do in the gate, um, you can do locally as well. Um, if you check out DevStack, you can you can bring it up. DevStack actually lets you specify the Git URLs that you want to pull each of the projects from. So instead of pulling from the default upstream master, you could actually point it at your own Git repo wherever it is on the network, on local, or make changes directly in the DevStack tree, um, and then run the Tempest tests. Those will take you about. Um, we automatically configure at the end of a DevStack pull. We automatically configure Tempest for you to work on your machine. Um, and it's in, a, and it's in a tree, just an op stack tempest. Um, that you can run the tempest test. They'll take about forty five minutes. Um, yeah, and when you run the unit test, it'll run the style checker up front, or maybe it's at the end. It runs the style checker at the end. But we, yeah, yeah. So the style checker is baked into the unit tests, and then um, and then run tempest, and that that should basically give you what happens at the gate. There's a couple edge conditions around the way the docs get generated and everything else that you might hit once you get upstream, but in reality, if you run all the rest of that stuff, everyone will love you because honestly, half the, half the changes that get pushed the first time, they clearly didn't run the unit tests, right? And it's like, <laughs> there we are, we're cut off, it's beer time. If you wanna talk to me, I'm hanging out up here um, for a little bit after this.